Good evening, and welcome to the Hollywood Babylonians. Hello, 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 friends. This is your happy Hollywood history host, Mr. Ben Burke, here with another episode of the Hollywood Babylonians, your favorite classic film and Hollywood history podcast in which we talk about the greatest films of old Hollywood and the history behind them. And today we are here to talk about our seventh film, our seventh film. That's amazing. We made it to seven. Uh, John Frankenheimer's 1962 political thriller from United Artists, The Manchurian Candidate, starring Frank Sinatra, Angela Lansbury, Lawrence Harvey, Janet Leigh, Henry Silva, Leslie Parrish, James Gregory, and on and on and on. And today I have with me a wonderful friend, a wonderful actor, a brilliant lover of all films, and a very intelligent, intelligent individual, Mr. Graham Bryant. Hello, how are you? Howdy, hey. I am doing just fine, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Oh, of course. I'm so excited to have you here because I know you love movies like I love movies, Mm -hmm. Uh, even though if we love, you know, different types of if you like newer stuff and I like older stuff, which is just fine. We can love what we want to. Um, (laughs) But Graham also uh, hosts an amazing podcast called What's in the Boxed, which is Mm -hmm. where he and is it your girlfriend? No, it's uh, uh, it's my friend Amber. Okay, that's I knew her name was Amber. I wasn't sure. Well, we won't start that rumor. They're not dating. Yeah. Um, but he and his friend Amber jump on What's in the Box. They talk about some movies that they love and why they love them. Do you want to tell us more about What's in the Box and where we can I- find you? Absolutely. So we are on Spotify and Apple podcast as what's in the box. It's like the quote from seven by Brad Pitt, but with the key being that the last word is B O X D. The reason why, uh, when Amber and I became friends, we both had letterbox, uh, accounts Mm -hmm. and we would use that to kind of, as a shorthand to kind of see where each other's tastes lie and be able to recommend things to one another. So our concept for starting this podcast together was we wanted to create a show that would go over niche topics and or lists or filmographies and kind Mm -hmm. of talk about films overall rather than necessarily doing interpretations or direct reviews of just one specific film or something like that. We wanted to talk about the broader ideas surrounding them. Mm. And so, yeah, we're currently... Uh, We currently have four episodes out, probably five by the time this releases. Uh, We should have one up tomorrow morning about Jordan Peele's favorite horror films and kind of what inspired him to create the stories that he did and where he uh, plucks his references from and why he's such a powerful voice in the box offices right now. That's amazing. Yes, I am a big fan of Jordan Peele. Have you seen his latest movie? I did see Nope. Okay. Um, what what I haven't seen it yet, but what are your thoughts on Nope? I thought it's my second favorite film of his. I think okay. Get Out is still probably his best one, but right. Nope is a film that when you go in and watch it, if you don't have any preconceived notions of what it's going to be, you will get the impression that this guy is just a nerd mm-hmm. and he just absolutely loves film and you can see all the little different areas that he's pulling references from and inspiration from there's like a whole scene that feels like jaws and one scene that's like i think ripped from an anime and i just (laughs) thought he was going absolutely unhinged doing whatever he wanted to do and it was amazing well and that's awesome and i mean we have an amazing canon of films to pull from to do that now yeah you know people say nothing comes from inspiration i mean nothing is original anymore it all comes from inspiration is what i was trying to say you gave me a very confused look but i think (laughs) uh, i think it is original to take that many different levels of inspiration and combine them together into one project we would agree with you yeah we talk about it uh for a little bit on uh, we talk about it for a little bit in our latest episode about how it still feels fresh, even though it's coming from a long legacy of people before him. Right, exactly. And yeah, that's amazing. So everybody go listen to What's in the Box and tune into their Jordan Peele episode. 
I am so excited to I'm so excited to finally have you on because when I first yeah. asked you several months ago, my life has been all over the place. And so <laughs> I thought we were going to be able to record a long time ago. So when I first asked you, you said Night of the Hunter and Harvey, and I know you like Wait Until Dark also. So we Ooh, may have, yes, that yeah, one. get mm-hmm. around to different some of those. But uh the person that was gonna talk to me about this film pulled out at the last minute, which is fine. We still love that person and they're mm. off producing their own off-Broadway show, so we got to love that person. Well, dar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> instead, of, instead of being on a podcast, they have to right. produce their own off-Broadway show that they wrote and are sometimes starring in. It's actually, have you heard of Stranger Things? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I love Stranger Things. Are, is the, are, did you, oh, Stranger Sings? Yes, it's a new parody off-Broadway musical. Ah, yes. no, I hadn't heard of that yet, but that makes sense. Okay, and this guy that was going to be on here with me is obsessed with Angela Lansbury, and at the last second, he pulled out. And I was like, oh, you know, it might damn. be for the best, because I feel like this movie ruins Angela for a lot of people. Um, really? Well, I mean, oh, just, I loved her in this. Yes. Oh, I did too. But just the fact that she's not Mrs. Pot, she's not Jessica mm-hmm. Fletcher. She is one of the greatest film villains. Or and, Mrs. Lovett. Mrs. Lovett. Mine. I know, <laughs> yeah. I know. Even Mrs. Lovett is lovable. There it's it takes a lot for me to really try to to love Eleanor Island because mm-hmm. she's just she has so much sociopathic ambition behind her that it's mm-hmm. it's terrifying. We're going to get to Night of the Hunter and Harvey and Wait Until Dark eventually. I just thought this movie would be right up your alley, and I yeah. hope you liked it. So, yes. Okay, you're shaking <laughs> your head yes. What? Okay, <laughs> starting off, what are you, some of your thoughts? Did you like it? Did you not like it? I was really... So, when the movie started, it took me a bit to get into it, and mm. then there is a scene where he... It, it's Shaw, right? That's mm-hmm. the play by Lawrence? Lawrence Harvey, yes. Lawrence Harvey, right. Uh-huh. So, when Shaw is stepping off of the plane, and we're immediately greeted by his parents, mm-hmm. it went from a war film to something that felt a little heightened and a little yes. comedic, and I wasn't... Like, I was kind of, like, giggling at it, the way that they were setting it up. I I found it really fresh. And Uh then you get about halfway through the film. I was was wondering at what point I was supposed to start taking it seriously for Mm -hmm. a little bit. Because, like, you have the scene where Frank Sinatra is talking about the nightmare that he had. And it's literally a woman talking about flowers, about hydrangeas. And then I I, I laughed at that and didn't know whether... Like, I'm like, at at the time, were we supposed to be, like, drawn in or intrigued? Mm Because, like, also this film has become such a staple in pop culture that, like, people know what the phrase Manchurian candidate means. Mm -hmm. And I, but halfway through the film, I started caring about the characters uh, when we learn about uh, Shaw's uh, love interests that he had back in the day i i was really heartbroken by that and Mm -hmm. at that point forward once we get into some of the twists that happen throughout the film which i i saw coming but it was still executed very well Mm -hmm. i really admired the structure of the film and how it was having all the pieces come together and um i what i was enthralled by the time we got to the climax of the film Yes. Oh, I think everybody that's that's one of the the things that I love most about this film is I saw it when I when I was first 12 years old with my grandmother. Wow. Which is okay. probably not a good time to see this movie <laughs> when you're 12. But I remember at that time having to stand up and kind of like run and jump around the room while Sinatra's, you know, running to the light booth to see mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um but you talked about like you weren't sure whether to laugh or what was going on with this. Um, This is based on a 1959 novel by Richard Condon, who was known for political satire. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of this book is political satire. You can see it in the Iceland's relationship. It's all farcical. You're right. Um, And she and you even see that like she comes to the conclusion in the one scene where Iceland is like, can you just please give me one give number. me a number <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> number of communists and she's like okay 57 and then you see it's from the he- the the ketchup bottle the 57 mm. right oh i missed yes. that yeah, oh, yeah that's yeah. hilarious uh so i mean yeah there's so many different like little things like that and even the fact that 
you think when Josie comes in in the party scene dressed as a queen, you're like, oh, this is another element of somebody trying to control Raymond. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, this is just this is just farcical consequence that this happened. Exactly. During that part, I was like, okay, so is she a plant too? And is when Frank Sinatra talking to her, is she going to reveal something or is she going to be genuine? What's going on? Yeah, I felt bad for him. Like, just very bad by the time we got to the extent of seeing the relationship he had with his mother and then how everybody seems to want something from him and he can never just like be. Exactly. And yes, he it's he can never just be he is he is a product of his mother and in some ways he's just as much of a sociopath as he, as she is he has mm-hmm. he's completely closed his, himself off from the world so until he meets Josie he has no ability to feel empathy for anybody or feel anything from the rest of the world and i think that you know sinatra is sinatra and he gives a great you know it's like he he does the white hand the white man karate bit with like the flat hands where he when he's fighting the the valet yes uh, yes yes um chun jin um Mm. which angela lansbury what does she call him fu manchu or something something really bad yeah (laughs) i I noticed that (laughs) and yeah and i mean that's part of part of yeah the where america was and partially still is at this time but sinatra plays sinatra and i think that was perfect for the character it was wonderful that lawrence harvey got to play that role because he does he is i don't know if you've seen him in anything else he no okay he closes himself off so well and then you start to feel for him just because of these little nuanced things that he does I thought he was, like, doing a bit, like, he wanted us to laugh at him and not root for him, so that when he does the the heightened things later, we aren't as, like, connected to him. I Mm -hmm. didn't know if that was the posturing that they were wanting to do. And then you get that monologue at the table where he just completely falls apart, and I was just like, holy crap. And then I looked at his filmography, and I'm like, I've never heard of him in any other titles right well and i mean we i have some notes on on the different people playing or at least the interesting people that are in this film okay um but he is one he was starring in a lot of british films he had kind of built up uh, an image around himself as this very suave kind of sophisticated playboy Mm -hmm. and then in 1959 he was in a film called room at the top which got him an Academy Award nomination. So then he switched from British films to American films. And that's where uh-huh. he was in, if you've heard of Butterfield 8 with Elizabeth Taylor. I have not. Okay. That's one. That's a good one in 1960. I think she won the Oscar for that. He was in The Alamo with John Wayne. He mm. was in, um, and this is all pretty much in the early to mid 60s. He was in one of my favorites, which is The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm, which is one of those 1960s overbloated children's musicals. You know, uh-huh. um, like Sound of Music or Chitty Chitty Bang Bang that mm-hmm. flopped at the box office. Um, and then he was in he he was a avid smoker and drinker. And so I believe he passed away in 73 or 75 from stomach uh-huh. cancer. Since we're on the topic of Lawrence Harvey, I guess we should talk about him and who he was in the book somewhat that character okay. he was he was married several different times but he was gay and a lot of people in hollywood knew that at this point but it, you know it couldn't be outed because you know he could uh, of course he'd never work in hollywood again mm. because of who he was and the character in the book it, it starts out at the very beginning talking about Raymond Shaw and you see in the very beginning when he's in the whorehouse or mm-hmm. is that a, is that a stare is a, that a brothel a brothel kinda, yeah there we go uh but he's repulsed by these women and at the mm-hmm. very beginning of the book it talks about how he is repulsed by all women he cannot be oh. with a woman or anything and, like that and you have the Oedipal thing going on with his mother and you see yes. the relationship he has with her and yes so it's like, and oh, that's okay. another uh, there's a lot of stuff in the book and the movie follows the book very very closely but because of the production code of the time and the, the Hayes fact code that, yes they could mm. not make a four hour long movie they had to cut some of that out there is so much sex in the book so, so much sex. Um, but even with Josie in the book, before he gets brainwashed, he has a very intimate relationship with Josie. I mm. mean, in the movie, he has a very intimate relationship. Mm. In the book, 
they never kiss, they never touch, they never do anything. They're just together oh. and he loves being with her. And in the book, um, the com oh, the the communist psychiatrist that brainwashes him mm -hmm. after he after they have the whole the whole nightmare dream where Frank Sinatra remembers what happens in the communist amphitheater. The um the Chinese psychiatrist takes Raymond out, and the last thing he does is breaks down all of his barriers towards women. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so then he can okay. have a very full sex life with any woman he wants to, which does not completely change the character because throughout the rest of the film he's repulsed by most people. Right. Um, but it does make him. It does allow him to have sex. So the fact that Harvey was gay. And that the character in the film was repulsed by all women. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's there's some synonymous things going on there, which I think make him a perfect candidate to play Raymond Shaw. And Frankenheimer said mm -hmm. when they were trying to cast this character that they went through about a million different people. And Harvey, in the end, was the they found to be the perfect person to play the part because he could play it so well. So many people had reservations because Lawrence Harvey was English. But jfk at the time did not exactly have an american accent either so they thought that would work well, to, well with jfk and angela lansbury was english she plays his mother so it makes sense that you know they have the same accent and that he grew up with her true yes yes and then the stepfather being very southern and yes very mm. rugged is, is there anything else that you love in the movie that you didn't I, love in the movie? It was freaking crazy how in 1962, everyone was just really into solitaire. Just uh, yeah. all the time. <laughs> all the, well, and that's one thing, too. It's like, why don't you pass the time by playing a little solitaire? It's like, we don't, I mean, it's we a, might get on our phone and play solitaire, but. Well, but it's a very specific, like, phrase. Like, you know, even I played, like, solitaire as a kid before I had a phone. But, like, it was just really funny how circumstantial it, that topic was coming back up over and over again. Yes. Um, I think. I loved, I ended up loving it. And then the one thing that I didn't, that kind of took me out of it was the scene at the very end where Frank Sinatra is moralizing about what just happened and giving like this yeah. very dramatic speech into the camera, telling you what the film was about and what you're supposed to take away from it. And the, his love interest is just sitting there, not saying anything. She doesn't and he's say just kind of talking to her. Um, right. Which I thought she was great. I, I thought she was fun in the film. I was just kind of waiting to see where she would come into play. And well, then she doesn't that much. Yes. And then that's another thing. I, I mean, we might as well talk about the book right now. Uh, Richard okay. Condon's 1959 book, because it explains a lot of the film that you're kind of left there sat wondering right. why some of these things are happening. Um, but like Frank Sinatra's postscript, I mean, was a little heavy handed at the end mm -hmm. of the movie. It could have just ended with him watching Lawrence Harvey shoot himself. Right. Um, and that's one thing I probably should have warned you about. I was I should have said there's a lot of dead bodies and you see a lot of people get shot. I was I was OK overall. I was surprised when it happened, but I but uh, well, I kind of not surprised. I saw it coming, but it still hit really hard i know it's like well what's he gonna do after he does this it's like oh my gosh right i know well yeah it does and by the end of the movie even at the beginning of the movie the first half feels farcical by the time he gets to spoilers shooting Iceland and his mother yeah. and himself you are let i mean I, I well i've seen it a million times i watched it again last night and i was like Whew, that mm -hmm. was a lot to take in <laughs> There's, uh, but you're right, because it it does feel farcical, even when we're seeing him kill his uh, fellow soldiers, mm -hmm. fellow servicemen in that scene. It's also like, you know, it's going to happen, but it's played up so much that it's like, oh, it's like, hey, go ahead and strangle this guy. And he's like, hey, what are you doing? No, 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 no. Just relax. It's like, oh, OK. And then it's really over the top. And then Frank wakes up in a cold sweat. And right. I was like, OK. Well, and who wakes up in a cold sweat like that anymore from a nightmare going, ah! Exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I am glad so I don't fun. have night terrors like that. 
But oh. um, yeah, and I mean, at the time, I guess that's the only way they knew how to convey it on the screen, even though there were other ways to convey yeah. it. No, I mean, that was the accepted way on the screen. Right. But talking about like the 1959 novel, there are some yes. key differences. First and foremost, I think we need to talk about Eleanor Eislin. What are your thoughts on that character? I enjoyed the character a lot more than I thought I would mm -hmm. at the beginning, because at the beginning you get the sense, like, obviously it's freaking Angela Lansbury, but I'm like, right. I don't have a reference for how big she was at the time or how much the name carried any weight back right. then. But you, you got the sense that they weren't supposed to be taken seriously and mm -hmm. you didn't know like that they were just going to be a thing to use to frame this, to frame Shaw's uh, personality and his temperament and get, give right. a sense of background. But then I really, I, I think overall, I really enjoyed Lansbury's portrayal of the character and how you just subtly saw the layers come out of how much control she had Mm -hmm. over any given circumstance the way the, i love the dialogue she has with what what is josie's father's name again senator senator jordan senator jordan mm -hmm. love the scene that yes. she has with him when when they're talking behind the tent and yes. there's that sense of formality but like they know each other well and they're old enough to know what this conversation actually is and you see like the anger in her right I and I love the monologue that she has with her son when when he's sitting there in the chair and yes. you get the sense like before when, when she was talking about Josie to him I didn't know how seriously to take her because it felt exactly like what Jordan said that like well she calls anybody who disagrees with her a communist because mm -hmm. she called um the newspaper uh writer yeah. the the newspaper like guy hobart also. Gaines or something yeah like Gaines. That. yeah yes yeah. she calls Gaines a communist as well and it's like well not really like he's a republican like right he wouldn't be and so but yeah there there's this set, like i found it believable that she's this awful person who is rationalizing this thing towards her son like i didn't know it was going to be you that doesn't change anything like i wish it wasn't but like it's mm -hmm. it, it's all aligning and going forward and right. i don't know i felt like they wrote her much better than they could have at the time for mm -hmm. a villainous woman character like they, they could have made her way more two-dimensional and mm -hmm. flat and i just didn't feel that at all i think the performance was great and i think the way that they paced it felt very believable as well. Oh, yeah. And there's one thing about Ang that Lansbury said um, at the time. It sounds like from interviews that she gave later on when she read it, she read Eleanor Island as a two dimensional character. We'll get into the book in just a second mm -hmm. and why she's very much a three dimension. She has very, very many dimensions, but she said mm -hmm. the one redeeming character quality that she found in Eleanor Island is in that ending monologue when mm -hmm. right before she kisses Raymond and she says she's you know she said I will make them pay for what they did to you she said it shows that as a mother she has some devastation as to what happened to him because of her power mm -hmm. you know and she said that's the one redeeming quality that she was devastated at the loss of her son because he's pretty much lost at that that point yeah. of, uh, in that point in the movie she had well and for okay first you were talking about like angela lansbury you didn't know how much weight she carried no. at that time so she was the daughter of a um, mgm contract actress myrna mcgill myrna mcgill had been big musical comedy star in the west end in the teens and the 20s around world war one so uh myrna mcgill those teens and 20s sorry those teens and 20s. <laughs> forgot Not about what year 20s. it was <laughs> <laughs> yes. but um they because of world war ii they left and went to um America, United States of America, because they were living in London. And she, her mother started work as a small contract act, actress, primarily at MGM, um, which was the Rolls Royce of all Hollywood studios. And because of Myrna McGill, uh, her mother, she got a contract at MGM um, and she signed on to play the role of Sybil Vane in the 1945 adaptation of The Picture of Dorian Gray. And mm. what ended up happening was she was first plugged into a film called Gaslight with Ingrid Bergman and Charles Boyer. 
You've that's on it. my watch list. Yes. Like I, I'm, I've been meaning to watch that one. After, yeah. Especially after seeing this. I'm like, okay, well, I want to see what the other thing she's known for. Right, yeah. right. So she was in Gaslight first in 1944. She was 18 years old. Well, 17 to 18 years old. And she was Jesus. nominated for um, uh, Best Supporting Actress at 18 years old in Jesus. 1944. Okay. But then uh, she stayed at MGM from about 43 to 53. And she was constantly cast as roles kind of like Eleanor Island. She was always these, she was never the lead, which she said mm -hmm. she found, she found very, very frustrating because she'd constantly go to Louis B. Mayer and she'd be like, well, don't you think I should play this role that um, Lana Turner's playing or Ava Gardner's playing? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, 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 Angie, you need to stay in the background. But she was always playing these supporting characters always stealing the picture because she was getting mm. some uh she was getting nominated for best supporting actress over and over and over again throughout these films that she made from 43 to 53 but in 53 louis v mayer had been fired another man had taken over the studio and so she she told her agent she's like i don't want to be here anymore so he got her out of her contract and from 53 really to 62 she was in a lot of different television shows, movies off and on, like um, The Court Jester, uh, Reluctant Debutante, different. They were big films, but um, she didn't have a full on contract. And she talked about like she trying to raise children at that time, even with a husband. She said how difficult that was without a Hollywood Damn. contract. But then I think, OK, do you remember you've heard of Anyone Can Whistle? Yes, uh, okay. I, I know the title. Yeah. OK. So that's, oh, I think Sondheim wrote it, and it came out in around 60 or 61. So she mm. was in bro on Broadway for that, um, and that ran like a week or two and then closed. And then shortly after that, she got involved with John Frankenheimer, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. We have to skip ahead to 1966, because in 66, okay. Jerry Herman, who wrote Hello, Dolly, had written a new musical called Mame, which Mary Martin, Broadway Broadway veteran, was supposed to be mame in that and she pulled out at the last minute and jerry herman had seen her in anyone can whistle and he said i want her so he got her for mame and she won uh the tony for that and then she won the tony the following year for another musical herman wrote called dear world and then she i mean that kind of just started her on her road down massive broadway success out of the mm -hmm. movies but um the reason that she was with after anyone can whistle she got involved with john frankenheimer um, Frankenheimer had, was making an adaptation of a book called All Fall Down, and I think you would enjoy that movie, okay. um, All Fall Down. Uh, he was making it at MGM, and Angela uh, was – he had hired Angela to play the mother in that, the mother to Warren Beatty. And in that movie, she also had a kink for her son, Warren Beatty. So, uh, you know, two back-to-back -back films where she played a mother that was kind of uh, sexually – fascinated with their sons so yeah, she was at all fall down which is a critically acclaimed movie it has warren Beatty, angela lansbury carl malden eva marie saint really big stars for that time period it did not do well because the critics at the time most people in America weren't able to wrap their head around a family drama that was kind of incestuous in that way frankenheimer after they after in post-production for All Fall Down, Frankenheimer had gotten in touch with George Axelrod. George A Axelrod was a writer of Broadway plays, of film scripts, and a producer. And Axelrod went to Frankenheimer and he said, that I think that this book, The Manchurian Candidate, would make a fantastic film. So he and Frankenheimer got together, they bought the book, they read the book, and then the every Hollywood studio pretty much had turned The Manchurian Candidate down because politically... You know, in in the zeitgeist, in you know, so socio politically, I guess you could say, it it felt like it was dynamite. Like you know, it mm -hmm. was not going to be something that was well accepted. Um, they were still kind of reeling. Hollywood was out of the time of the blacklist. And y'all were just talking about Doctor Strangelove, like mm -hmm. just a while back. So like, yeah, it feels still very hot. Prevalent. Yes, yes. So it was very hot. Frankenheimer and Axel Rod, they had heard that Frank Sinatra was very much interested in the book. So they bought the rights for a very low price because no studio in Hollywood wanted it. So they bought it for a very low price. And then they called Sinatra and they said, well, we've just bought the rights. Would you be interested in being in this movie? And he said, yes, absolutely. And once they got him on board, then it turned into like a big, 
big motion picture because you know despite whether we love i love sinatra's music but whether we love him or not as a person <laughs> he was a big star at that point yes shortly after that after they got sinatra on board frankenheimer had the book to manchurian candidate he walked in on lansbury looping lines for all fall down and he threw the book on the table and he said this is your next role you would be perfect playing the mother Mm -hmm. Um, even though she was two years older than Lawrence Harvey at that time, which she would, I mean, she played it beautifully. I mean, when I saw the film and this is bad, but when I saw the film realized what year it had come out and how old she looked in the film, I Mm -hmm. was, I had to look up how old is Angela Lansbury? (laughs) And yeah, I'm, I'm knocking on wood right now, but she's 97. Yeah. And that's, absolutely insane it's that, like she's been that big for that long like it's right. incredible well and she was playing women even that old in when she was in her late teens early 20s so she mm-hmm. had done it for a long time and she said that you know she was like well this character is you know too old for me because she was supposed to be 49 at the time that the book was set she said it. she had as an a famous hollywood actress she had been at the homes of Wa- famous Washington politicians and had, she said, as many actresses and actors do, noticed their wives, you know, and taken little bits, it, their wives, how they carried themselves, how they talked, how they dressed, you know, and she said they did nothing to age her. It ended up being, because they didn't have the budget to do it, it ended up being how she carried herself from mannerisms, how she talked. I was going to say she pulled it off. She like, did. I'm like, I'm like, I get that like that might be frustrating, but you're doing it well. So yeah, she did it incredibly well. And one more thing about that, the character in the movie, Sinatra was good friends with Lucille Ball. And that's who he wanted when he signed on. Ooh. He told um, Frankenheimer, I want Lucy to play this role. And and Frankenheimer said, well, I really think Angela Lansbury would be phenomenal. Lansbury also had been, uh, it had been kind of a big ordeal that she was not nominated for Best Actress for All Fall Down. Because so many people was like, were like, her performance in this movie is amazing. She plays a very outspoken Midwestern housewife, you know, who's, of course, sexually fascinated with her son. I'll, I'll just keep saying that. So you stick your tongue out every single yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, he wanted, you know, he wanted to give her some clout. She was not nominated for the Manchurian candidate, even though she did not win. Lucy Sinatra tried to get Frankenheimer to cast her. Frankenheimer showed him before it was released all fall down. And he was like, this is why Lansbury should play this role. And Sinatra was like, actually, you're probably absolutely right. So that's how she got in on the ground level. Now, the character of Eleanor Iceland, I don't want to spend the entire episode talking about Eleanor (laughs) Iceland, even though it's almost like- We'll get back to her, but yeah. yeah. The entire film- happens because of her you know because of you her learn later yeah <laughs> yes and especially in the book as a child you find out she she's the daughter of a uh i don't want to say a very famous politician she's in love with her father she thinks her father has hung the oh. moon as a child it, it describes all of this in the book she hates her mother she hates her older brother what happens is her father dies when she's like 10 years old and you mm-hmm. find out that um every night her father had come to her and had they had slept together so she already has a past of of child sexual child abuse in the book oh my god yes yeah and then after her father dies she develops this great big disgust with her mother because she thinks her mother is just this stupid little woman and then her brother Eleanor Islin at one point in the book, when she's a child after her father has died, she cannot get their Cocker Spaniel to perform a trick. So she nails its paw to the floor. And then her brother beats her very heavily with a hockey stick. So she not only has she had sexual abuse as a child, she's had physical abuse as a child. And so then at 16 years old in the book, she starts going to older gentlemen's clubs and dressing herself older so she by the time she's 16 or 17 she's pregnant with raymond from an older politician oh my god yes i know so (laughs) many so many problems but these are all things these are all things that like would be monologues at the penultimate episode of every season exactly tv show now like we would hear all of that now it is in the films back then probably not but it's like what the hell no well and it's all part of the the hayes code they couldn't you know they couldn't do any of this stuff in the hayes code so she very young age develops a plan for herself to gain political power through her husband so she can be the one in the background Mm -hmm. It, it sounds like in the book 
that Raymond's father, who she divorced, well, it, Raymond says Eleanor divorced him before he could even learn how to love him. It sounds like he was like a good, loving and caring man, whereas and but he was smart. Also, he was smarter than she was. And so she couldn't control him. Right. She couldn't control him. And that's when she met John Iceland, who actually in the book was law partner to Raymond's father. And so she, then she got pregnant by him. So they got a divorce. And, you know, the good the right thing to do would for them to be married mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, that gives you kind of a bit of a, a character breakdown. And in the book also, there's several there are several places that the book varies just because of the production code. Like they couldn't have certain things on the screen. But one of them is, you know, after she gives the monologue to Raymond, which I'm sure, you know, if it was made today, we might see it. But after she gives her final monologue to Raymond and kisses him, then it says, you know, she opens her robe and lets him in physically. So, um, no, it, well, no, that I don't know if they would do that. I, no, no, <laughs> well, I don't today. even know if they would do that today. But the thing is, she said the more she kept looking at him, Raymond, throughout the book, especially close to the end of the book, she kept thinking of how much he looked like her father. Um, how much oh. he reminded you. Right, so, I mean, that gives some character explanation. It doesn't make allowances for her at all, but it definitely no, but adds so many more dimensions to her. I was, I loved, I just loved the way that, I don't, I don't know if it's like watching it now, it, the perspective of now watching backwards, but like, mm -hmm. I felt like it, was a very unapologetic performance that mm -hmm. with without a hint of regret until that moment but like even then that speech doesn't try to justify or rationalize why she do does everything she did it just shows that she wishes things could have happened differently but she's still yes. very undeterred in what she needs to do exactly um, I had some questions about the marketing. So two thoughts came to mind of, uh, in regards to the marketing that I was curious about with this mm. film. One is that where Angela Lansbury's name pops up in the opening credits, mm -hmm. it, it says something to the effect of, and also starring Angela Lansbury. We've seen the film and we know how she should be like way up at front right um because of how much she plays a role in the film do we think it was because of all of those factors you had mentioned before or because they didn't want to give away how much of a role she was going to have in the film because it pays off now looking back but i'm thinking maybe it's a political thing well possibly i don't know i've heard of Different. I, I'm not exactly sure of the answer to that. I know that Sinatra, mm -hmm. both Sinatra and Gene Kelly, who were best friends at the time, had right. problems with that. If something didn't go their way, it was going to show up on screen. It was going to show up in the editing. So that mm -hmm. possibly could have been that, um, you know, Sinatra still had a problem with Lansbury. Lansbury. Playing. Mm -hmm. But she but according to Lansbury later on in Hollywood, he was great friends with her. He was always like when she got the role of Mame on Broadway, mm -hmm. she was like, I don't know how I'm going to sing all of this music. And he said, well, he said, Angie, I will teach you every note to every Aww. song. So he could be a very caring person, but it po possibly could have been just like a political Political thing with um, Sinatra. Also, I think probably the titles were originally supposed to go up the go over the opening sequence in South Korea, um, mm. but when they previewed the film, nobody, everybody was so concerned with the titles that nobody actually caught on to what was happening to the patrol. Right, they were being kidnapped. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. And the fact that she was not had. Not like now we think of Angela Lansbury, you know, she, she's like on almost on par with Julie Andrews and Betty White. And at that time, she had not received that kind of clout. So putting mm -hmm. her name closer to the end of the titles. But in my opinion, watching the movie, I would be like, and also starring Angela Lansbury, putting her at, you know, kind of at the last is like, and also starring the woman who's making this all happen. It's kind of like, and also st starring uh, Warren Beatty in Network. And then you yeah. have that one scene where he comes in and does the whole speech and you're right. like, oh, that's why he's in the title card. Yes, exactly. She received a lot of critical acclaim 
that year, but you know, she still she they had to give her an honorary Academy Award several years ago because she never won one. She was nominated Jesus. four or five times. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now we're like, of course you would get an Academy Award. You're Angela Lansbury. Absolutely. But before then, before I, I think, you know, Mrs. Potts and Jessica Fletcher and her Broadway career, people did not appreciate her as they do now. Mm. Um, and there is so much to appreciate. The The second question I had, you brought up Korea, which is at, actually what I wanted to get into. Uh -huh. I noticed in the at least the poster that they had up on Wikipedia, it pulls a similar stunt to how Alfred Hitchcock marketed Psycho in that you have to watch this film from start to finish or else you're not getting the full experience of what this film is about. Right. And so it says something to the effect of if you, if you miss the first five minutes of this film, you will not understand what's going on for the rest of the film. Right. What is your take on that? Because my, I have takes on that. <laughs> my take on that is that they figured that out and probably put it on the poster after they put the title credits over the opening sequence and the mm -hmm. audience had no freaking idea what was happening. Mm -hmm. But that was that was with a lot of theaters. I know at times like that was the time kind of towards the close of like giant movie palaces, especially like in New York and giant metroplexes throughout the United States. They were like six to seven thousand seat theaters. So what would happen is in these giant movie palaces, they would have showings throughout the day, but people could come and go anytime they please. So a lot of people would okay. see the movie um, starting halfway through and then watch the first of the movie. This is a... And, that there were times where studio heads and directors and stuff like that tried to control that. Like the last movie we talked about, All About Eve, they tried to do that and mm -hmm. they ended up losing money because people would get so angry. They're like, why can't we show up anytime we want to and just watch it from, and you know, if you, if you don't watch it from the beginning or like mm -hmm. you don't watch All About Eve from the beginning or Psycho from the beginning, you are totally lost. Right. Right. I agree with that. I was curious because before I discovered that, uh, marketing tactic on the po the promotional poster, I had actually thought, you know what? I kind of wish I didn't see that part happen or, you know, be left a little bit more in suspense of wondering what's going on. And, oh, wait, he didn't actually save them and right. get the Medal of Honor for saving them? Like, what, what yeah. happened there? Like, that's crazy. I love the scene of him walking into the bar, though, and, like, scolding them and setting that, that um relationship right away because then when they all start praising him just like mm -hmm. endlessly you're you are taken a little bit aback but I, I i couldn't decide whether i liked the first five minutes of the film or or would have thought maybe it would have been stronger without it to, but that's from today's tastes and right. editing perspective well and that was part of frankenheimer saying that that was one of the strongest books he had ever read so he and axelrod the screenwriter decided to follow the book as closely as they possibly could and mm -hmm. richard condon started the entire thing out with them in korea so mm -hmm. that they did i guess they did the same but you know it could have left you wondering i feel like now with the, the types of films we see you know we can start at the ending and then work our way back to the beginning and i don't know if they might have been afraid that people couldn't completely follow a film like that so i mean we could have started out the entire thing at that at the the convention with lansbury and Iceland being shot yeah yeah, Damn, and then that working our way back. I wanted to talk about because the first time I watched this, well, not the first time I watched it, <laughs> the first time I watched it with Garrett McPherson, who's another one of our friends, right? Who's mm -hmm. also been on this podcast. He said, you know, the only purpose of Janet Lee really in this movie feels like she's just to give Frank Sinatra a love interest or somebody to talk to so that he doesn't <laughs> seem crazy the entire time, right? She's a sounding board, right? And in the book, she plays it's unfortunate because there are some things in in the book that they had to cut out that made her character feel just like love interest sounding board um, uh -huh. in the book Sinatra doesn't play it up as much as it's written in the book Marco is having a constant full on nervous breakdown because he cannot sleep without having these terrifying nightmares right. so he loses 50, Marco in the book loses 50 pounds he goes into many different psychiatric hospitals trying to figure out this problem and finally this this woman Eugenie Rose who he meets on the train he sees her and he thinks that she's the most beautiful woman in the world but he immediately starts crying and has to you know they're on the train like mm -hmm. one in between the train cars wherever they are and a lot of their dialogue is straight out of the book. But it's great. 
It is. Oh, yes. It's perfect for the both of them. She follows him, though, like she does in the book. And in the book, moreover, you see how much his he is deteriorating and she swoops in and she saves him. Like, you know, they sleep together a lot. She she causes him to fall asleep. She's kind of his saving grace because at the end of the day, he has to swoop in and save the entire movie. You right. know, so without her, you don't have without her helping save Marco, you don't have. Um, Marco coming in and being able to save the United States of the Amer- of America from Islandism. But then at the mm-hmm. same time, she has, you know, she talks about in, in the car ride on the way from the police department, she talks that she just called her fiance and she broke up with him because she met Marco and she loved, and you're like, oh, this is the silly, this is like Doris Day, Rock Hudson, silly 1960s movie. Right. But it's very the, funny. Yeah. Yes. In the book, the same thing happens. And, but her, first fiance that she broke up with you meet him in the book his name is am jack he works for the fbi mm-hmm. and in the book okay so this is another kind of little long side tangent in the book marco starts having these nightmares so he contacts raymond shaw and raymond shaw and he sit down in raymond's apartment in new york and raymond said well the only way really to get this reversed is you know if you have yourself court-martialed so they can investigate your report on the night of the patrol, where I was supposedly won the Medal of Honor. When Marco approaches the United States government to have himself court-martialed so they can investigate his original report from South Korea, mm. he is stopped because Raymond goes to lunch with his mother, and they go to lunch at the plaza in the book, and he tells her un- unknowingly that she is his American operator. So she puts a stop to the whole thing. She goes to the United States army and at the time you know she threatens them she said my husband will call you out as communist if you do not help me do this so they yes so (laughs) that this general has to tell marco you have to sign over we will we will promote you to from captain to colonel if -hmm. you put your name down we'll pay you so much money if you completely forget about this whole ordeal and that's how he becomes the is that how he becomes the I'm forgetting what his job was immediately after the army, the military that, in the book, that in, was, the, in the film. You it know. was was it like public relations? It was that, something like that. Right. He's just sitting there to have like the secretary called out as a communist and right. then loses his job. Yes. Because he did nothing to stop that. Well, that's in the book, too, but that's a whole different... I mean, that okay. the book is... Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but he does... We have to talk about the public relations scene, though, with all the television mm. cameras, because oh, that is a... Oh, so gorgeous. That is a beautiful, beautiful yeah. scene. And that's a, one of the first times on film that that was ever done. But we'll get back to that in just a second. So, what Marco does is because the general offers him this and the general tells him behind closed doors, he said, look... I know there's something fishy about these night nightmares. I know there's something fishy. This is all below board. He said, this is against my will to give you this. He said, I can't believe that the United States Army has come to this. And he said, but the president of the United States has ordered me to do this. To Well, not the president of the United States. The United States Army has ordered me to do this. So the general orders Marco to keep quiet over this entire story. And so then the oh, general God. commits suicide, which is a bit... Frankenheimer said there was a lot of scenes in the book that he wished he could put in the movie that was a subplot that they Mm. could not put in the movie because it would take too much time so what marco has to do then in the book is with eugenie rose's first fiance he has to team up with him who works for the fbi and they have to create a committee behind closed doors that investigates raymond shaw and his nightmares Mm. and that's how they figure out in the book that you know raymond is is pretty much an assassin for the russian government how many so, pages does this book have like I, how, how thick is this book is man? is really thick you know it was nine hours on audible <laughs> so oh i listened to it on audible but that okay. that's a very interesting little subplot but yes eugenie rose janet lee is there in the book because she provides the first fiance that works for the fbi that helps marco investigate raymond after the general has committed suicide you know, mm-hmm. and has to prom- make Marco promise that he'll sign himself over to s- silence, which he doesn't. But that's that's one of the reasons she's there. There's some other things in the book I wanted to talk about. The end scene, or the one of the last scenes between Marco and Shaw, where he tells him to rip out all the wiring, it's over, it's not going to happen to you any, you know, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to be controlled by them anymore. That scene takes place at a, like at a cafe in the Central Park Zoo. 
outside and what happened yeah in the book mm-hmm. which would be a little bit i i think yeah i'm glad that and they, had he like, just had he just killed Josie at that point yes he had just cu- killed Josie as well okay yes. so he was pretty distraught yeah. but what marco figures out in the book that he cannot rip out shaw's wiring so he instructs raymond shaw to to kill his mother and his father or to kill his mother and his stepfather so in the movie and Mm -hmm. see they okay let me see if i can explain this because of the production code marco could not have gotten away with murder even assisted homicide like he did in the book Mm -hmm. because he instructed jaw to assassinate his mother and his stepfather he they couldn't have done that so they had to make it a a personal decision on raymond shaw's part to shoot his mother and his father. And in the book, then after he sh- Raymond shoots his mother and his stepfather, Marco goes up to the lighting booth and hypnotizes him again and gets him to shoot himself because he mm. says he's the army takes care of his own. So it's Raymond, it's Marco that gets Raymond to shoot his mother, his stepfather, and himself in the book. They couldn't have done that in the movie because of the production code. It gives Marco a little bit more to do in terms of the film. Because, you know, like, looking at his role in the film, with the way everything happens, it kind of feels like, oh, well, he was there as a witness and as Mm -hmm. the one guy who knows who Raymond Shaw really was. I kind of like how they handled it in the film. Because when when he was Mm -hmm. giving him an order that all the wiring is cut, but also giving him the order to report back and to tell to tell them what was going on i'm like but then he would still be under somebody's control so this was the only way like out like algebraically that Mar- that uh not marco that raymond could have done anything to where he had his own autonomy right exactly and in the movie though it does cause me great concern because the scene mm-hmm. the scene between lansbury and Raymond, the very last scene when she kisses him, it spots uh-huh. halfway through their kiss. At that time, the scene with Marco had just taken place the scene before. So at that time that Lansbury made love to Raymond, Marco had already ripped out of his ripped out all of his wiring. So he was acting, he was not actually hypnotized. He had made love to his mother without the act of hypnotism. That scene was in the film? Well, like no, they, like no. They, you, it's supposed to be inferred, according to Frankenheimer, that, you know, they cut halfway through the kiss. So it's like they cut halfway through the kiss. Who knows what's oh. happened after the kiss? But it's supposed to be inferred that they made love. But anyway, so then Raymond did not make love under him. Taking a lot of cues from Psycho, actually, this this <sighs> film is. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, all about controlling mothers. No, I was going to say, before we move too far away from the deprogramming scene, though, mm-hmm. gorgeous. This, the camera trick that they do where uh marco is out of focus mm-hmm. but we see we see shaw's face in clear like clear front and center right i loved that and i was like if they did that today it would look like shit but because of the camera and the coloring and the way the way that it stylistically feels appropriate i loved how they pulled that off and that it actually seems somewhat subtle compared to the other film tricks that they were doing in the film. Right. Well, okay. That, that is actually a story that I have written down. That was all, right. all by accident. I know. Whoa. Mind blown. Whoa. <laughs> Frankenheimer said, cause Sinatra was known throughout Hollywood as a one take man because oh, he believed man. his best performances were on his first take. He believed in spontaneity. He could mm-hmm. never do it as well afterwards. And even Frankenheimer said, if we had to do two or three takes, they were never as good as the first one. So, and so he said he had a point. Mm-hmm. So they did a one take with Sinatra for that scene, Sinatra and Harvey. And he said it was brilliant and they loved it. And they said, mm-hmm. great, cut. The second camera operator was supposed to focus the camera and he did not focus it on Sinatra. Mm-hmm. So when they watched the rushes the next day, Frankenheimer said that was the longest walk he had ever taken was to Sinatra's trailer after they watched the rushes because he had to go tell him we have to retake that scene you were brilliant in it but you were out of focus they were about to retake it then sinatra got laryngitis and then they had to put it off and then they did a day of retakes where they shot all day long they did like 20 different takes Uh it was never as great as the first take and finally (sighs) frankenheimer was like screw it he said just put put the out of focus shot of sinatra in the film 
And then he started getting all of this fan mail. Like that was a brilliant choice. You it, know? Was. <laughs> yeah. it was because it was. It's totally shot. It totally makes it shot from Raymond's perspective, and yes. it has us feeling the way that he does. Exactly. Yes. Oh. It's so beautiful. But that's another thing we need to talk about while we're on the topic mm. is how Frankenheimer shot this film. It's ne- It's all very very wide angle lenses it was all shot Mm -hmm. with 18 millimeter lenses so everything was in focus he said he wanted to give the thing a very realistic and documentary style look which it does Mm -hmm. in 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 some ways i mean it feels like a lot of it around madison square gardens and yeah it's all it has a very once you get to yeah once you get to the climax i was gonna say this doesn't feel documentary anymore this just feels like very like i don't know very heightened and very fun Right, exactly. Yeah, but he wanted it to look like everything, like he had big objects in the foreground, and then the smaller object in the background, everything was an extreme focus. And that's what mm-hmm. how he wanted it to feel, because that's how documentaries were shot at the time. Some of the things that he did in this movie were first, were the first for all films, you know, okay. a, lot, a lot of firsts. This was the first film that really tackled McCarthyism, because Iceland is based on McCarthy. Edward R. Murrow had done that before. But mm-hmm. I mean, I think McCarthy passed away in 57, but the entire the entire Hollywood industry was still reeling from that. So that was the very first film that tackled McCarthyism. But mm-hmm. also, um, it was the first film to really give you that surreal feel that broke completely broke down the continuity of modernism in the nightmare scene. They had mm. to shoot six different combinations of that camera rotating around 360 Mm -hmm. and uh they weren't able to cut any of that cut between any of the 360 so what they had to do they had to have a giant hotel set built and they had to have a giant communist amphitheater set built and they had Mm -hmm. to put the camera in the middle of the sound stage and then both sets were on railroad tracks there were stage hands on this on the in the what it in the sound stage that mm-hmm. were pulling each of the sets around with giant cables, not pulling them around to make it look like they were going around. But as the camera, you know, the camera circles through the hotel mm-hmm. lobby and then all of a sudden you go into the communist amphitheater. And that was because they were pulling in and out the these giant sets and the actors were running from set to set, jumping on each set as, as oh, they were insane. going around. I know it's ridiculous. It's so fun. The, it, Edgar Wright did something. I mean, he didn't he didn't do anything with sets, but like there's these great sequences in um Last Night in Soho that just came out recently. Uh, not one of not one of my favorite Edgar Wright films, but a lot of people thought that there's these shots where two people are superimposed doing the same thing and they right. thought it was an editing trick, but it's not. It's just really clever camera work and really tight choreography moving around the camera all at the same time. And that like blew my mind when I actually watched the footage of them dashing in front of the camera and then switching right. and nobody like breaking character at any point. Isn't that amazing? I love when mm. I love when directors do that. Like if you have you seen Orson Welles' Touch of Evil? I haven't seen Touch of Evil, no. Okay. It has one of the longest the the it's the longest continuous opening sequence ever in a film. It goes on for like 10 minutes and you see a car be or a bomb be planted in the trunk of a car in Mexico and then you watch it cross the border into the United States and explode and all of this stuff is happening around it and it's just one long continuous shot. But stuff like this always just like blows my mind cuz it's theatrical. Mm. And we're theatrical people. I'm like, "Yes, they're doing it." I did it. Th- I did think of noises off when you were describing this of the giant yes. set being turned around by the stage hands and everyone in the house goes ooh so, and they yes. clap that the whole set turns around exactly yeah i know and plus people just love to watch andrew davis come out in his tight black shirt and flip oh, that set around you know absolutely how could yeah. you not how could <laughs> no. you not <laughs> Even behind the scenes of Manchurian Canada, it was like satire. It was farcical. But when they were editing that scene, yes, yes. the editor, Ferris Webster, because there are certain cuts between, you know, even though the camera keeps rotating, there are certain cuts from one thing to another. The editor, Ferris Webster, was becoming so... he. He watched all the footage and he was like, I don't know how to cut this. He was like, this is beyond anything I've ever done. Frankenheimer said he was busy directing 
a Manchurian candidate. So he got he brought in Ax- Axelrod, the co-producer and screenwriter. And he said, you need to go into the editing room and show him how to cut all of this. And Axelrod said, I've never cut a scene before in my entire life. He said, well, then that'll make it interesting. <laughs> and he said, I wouldn't know where to start. And he said, you know how to, you know, cut two different things in a scene. You know what we need to see, what we don't need to see. And so um, Axelrod took the script and went through the entire script and just like what he compared all the footage to the script and he just wrote down what he thought should be cut to and from how it should all be used and then he gave it to ferris webster ferris webster cut it together and that's why it came out in the film was because of axel rod the screenwriter cutting the scene not frankenheimer or the editor because it, it was it was so above all of their heads and it's hard to like there's no continuity between each thing because it's their psyche breaking down. Yes. So, yeah, I, yeah. I was like, yeah, as I was watching it, I'm like, this is really clever Yeah. for films like at this time to like have little things look like mistakes, but you realizing that they're not. And mm-hmm. me, uh, me laughing at the hydrangea lady who's talking. And then it's just the very subtle shift between scenes of like and then even like the pronoun usage i thought was so fun where it's like uh where it's like yes ma'am and it's yeah. like obviously talking to a communist man who's right. instructing him and i'm like oh that's so fun and well, like trippy and silly a little bit yes it is silly well one thing in the book that that frankenheimer in his commentary on the blu-ray did not take claim for this but in the book All of the men of the patrol said, yes, sir, not yes, ma'am. So Mm. it was George Axelrod who went in and was like, they're seeing a lady. They should be saying, yes, Mm -hmm. ma'am, which is just so. And then when the, you know, the black member of the patrol has the dream, Mm. Frankenheimer thought last minute, he was like, wouldn't he populate his entire dream with African-American women? And so that's, so that's when he oh i didn't get i didn't get that that was coming from his perspective i literally just thought that it was like okay their brainwashing thing is not working (laughs) like the way that they want it or because obviously it doesn't because they all have some memory of it and it's all breaking through right and they're having in the it felt like the dream kept changing or something Mm -hmm. like that but it was just the cracks in the program like showing and i that that was how i interpreted it because at one point aren't they all chinese is like asian and then at the next scene they're not and i thought it was only because they had brought up blaming the, uh, a chinese like battalion they said they say it in the dial reference it in the dialogue no i know one part of the amphitheater is russian one part of the amphitheater is chinese oh. so they may be cutting between that but like when the black man has the dream, the mm. hotel lobby is populated by all African American uh, women. So I, I had interpreted it as a very Freudian kind of like, oh, they keep changing uh, and they're not questioning it because they're brainwashed and well, they're, it's just being all fluid. I I, I wasn't yes. sure. Well, no, no, no. But I mean, it could be that at this point because I mean, there's no. How do you interpret dreams? <laughs> mm-hmm, so, exactly. and how do you interpret that? Because that's just all over the place. But I did want to talk about two the the scene where Iceland first calls out the secretary as being communist and mm-hmm. states that all of those number, you know, he keeps changing numbers. Um, and it's it's hilarious. Yeah. It is hilarious. Well, okay. First of all, all of the television monitors and all of the television cameras were live. They were live. They were working. Yes, each of the I could see that. Yes. And I was like, oh, I'm very impressed. And especially like I've filmed like an old TV set with a like, you know, with like a, a camcorder before right. when I was a kid and it looked like shit. And right. so to see them actually be as clear as they was, I was pretty impressed by that. Right, right. It showed up perfectly on film, each of those monitors. What had to happen was Frankenheimer had to set all of the extras and the leads like Angel. Well, Lansbury said later it was a very difficult scene to shoot because it had to be choreographed so well and you couldn't move at all. You had to sit it incredibly yeah. still because he told the camera operator what to do and then frankenheimer went he had worked primarily on television before this for like live television dramas uh which worked like this because this was live television you know filming of this mm-hmm. congressional hearing and they um frankenheimer went to the van the television van that was connected uh you know he could talk to all of the camera operators so oh, he wow. had to sit in the television van 
on the sound stage while the camera operator and cinematographer film the entire thing and communicate to the to the men running the television cameras. So it was all like a live three ring circus. That's insane. Yes. Yeah, because now it would be like a visual effects department uh, department's job to right. green screen all of it and make sure that things appeared in the right spot and weren't like conflicting right but it was it was all live it was all yes and the, so and it fun. was all done in one take he said they couldn't have done it in a second take because it worked so well in the first one and mm -hmm. people were just exhausted he said after they had nothing scripted for after iceland calls out the secretary and the secretary explodes frankenheimer said we had nothing scripted um i just said, told them to keep going and they improv that entire scene of them <sighs> screaming at each other <laughs> that's is, so fun <laughs> i know it's awesome and then well and then you know lansbury running out and you see her her back to sinatra that's the mm -hmm. only scene she was in with sinatra is her back to sinatra and her telling johnny he switches numbers just between several those very close was, sentences was he supposed to or was that just part of the improvisation that the numbers change in the book it said the numbers changed and i think that's okay. part of mccarthy never had the same amount of numbers right. from hearing right. to hearing from, you know, each meeting, he had a different amount of numbers. And I was just listening to a podcast on McCarthy, which origin story, everybody should go listen to that podcast in the, but okay. how closely Iceland and McCarthy mirror each other is insane. It just how close Richard Condon wrote it as wrote mm -hmm. Iceland as satire. Well, and in the book, Eleanor Iceland tells john island she said you keep changing those numbers and so that's what she insists on she said because that's going to keep them on their toes if you keep saying the same number they're going to get it, bored they're going to forget about it right, right. and they're going to start saying okay so who are these you know 57 names who are these 57 names who are these 57 names she said you have to keep them on their toes so go from 215 to 37 to 48 you know mm -hmm. all over that's the a very modern tactic now because then yes. people will cry foul and that'll keep the topic going exactly and it's uh -huh. all it's you know it has nothing to do with political affiliation or what you want for the country it is all fear-mongering and it is all to attain a certain position of power and that is what mm. eleanor iceland did that was that was what i was wondering about iceland at the very beginning we didn't hear outright what party affiliation he had and then right. you have them, you know, crying communist, but then you learn that, like, the people they're calling communists are Republicans. I don't even think we know what Senator Jordan's political affiliation is either, only that they don't like the Islands, which it seems like a lot of people don't like the Islands. So. Right. Well, and I don't think that they they call they didn't call it out the the certain political affiliation that each party had in the mm -hmm. book or in the movie and i think you know they wanted to keep that quiet for pr reasons but also yeah. you know being very well you know if if you know anything about politics you can kind of tell which political affiliations the jordans have which politi mm -hmm. political affiliations the islands have another thing that um is very similar to mccarthy is the fact jordan in all of his scenes like over his fireplace he has the eagle and he has the flags and that's supposed to s symbolize america and what we want it to be and then mm. iceland is constantly he has in all of his rooms he has either a statue of lincoln he has a picture of lincoln that in one of the uh, when raymond raymond he's comes, he's dressed as lincoln at the costume yeah. party yeah and then he desecrates the american flag that's in caviar mccarthy had had his winning speech i think in 51 or 52 when people really started seriously taking him serious like oh this is something really scary that we need to be worried about when it was completely like no he's kind of lying he wasn't lying about everybody he he got some he you know he did call out some communists well you know if you if you keep throwing stuff at the wall it, it'll eventually stick but, exactly like, that's yeah what, I don't... <laughs> yeah that's what these guys in this podcast said he finally found something that was successful and he threw he threw this fear-mongering communist calling tactic at the wall and it stuck and then it mm -hmm. grew and it grew and it grew mccarthy had his winning speech at the lincoln memorial and so that was he was so that's what he was you know synonymous with and a lot of people it was like oh it's mm -hmm. like abraham lincoln you know good right. old honest abe and so that's why they kept tying Iceland to Lincoln, which is another just brilliant little nugget Easter egg throughout the entire movie. Thank you for listening to the Hollywood Babylonian. <laughs> 
you have been listening to The Hollywood Babylonians. The Hollywood Babylonians is produced, edited, and hosted by Ben Burke and co-hosted by Graham Bryant. Audio engineering by Andrew Davis with artwork by Ben Burke and Jamie Lee. If you liked what you heard today, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe and follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at The Hollywood Babylonians for more Hollywood Babylonians content. Tune in next Friday, February 10th, for part two of the production history behind John Frankenheimer's 1962 political thriller, The Manchurian Candidate, with What's in the Boxed podcast host, Graham Bryant. Only on The Hollywood Babylonians. Thank you for listening and have a good night.